Good morning. I want to talk to you today about two seemingly very different ideas. But over the next few minutes, try to bring them together in such a way that will let you change the way you think about your health as you get older. I'm going to start talking about demographics and economics. There are about 7 billion people in the world today. That number is so big that it's fairly abstract. It's hard to put a concrete idea around what it means to have that many people. But one thing that we see is that scenes like this are becoming much more common. What do I mean by that? I mean, the people that we see sitting here together are probably, what, 60, 70, 80 years old? A century ago, this was a fairly rare sight. And I don't mean the invention of photography and the fact that we can take this picture. I mean the fact that we live so much longer now. Advances in healthcare over the last century have changed what the average person in the world looks like. In just over a century, we've managed to extend our average lifespan by about 30 years. So what does that mean and how did that happen? So let's take a look at a few things. Let me put up 10 fairly depressing words and phrases here. This represents what killed us in the year 1900 in developed nations. The relative size here of something is how many people it killed. So the first thing that we see is things like pneumonia, flu, tuberculosis were the biggest killers at that time. Now, this was before a lot of modern healthcare. So if we jump ahead to about five years ago, 2010, we see some major changes. So the first is that many of the things that were on that list disappear. Some of the others become much less prominent or important. However, we also know that some of them have started to impact many more of us. And of course, to fill out that list of 10, we need to add a few more things to that list. Now we get it back up to the relative size of 1900, and one thing is really clear. A couple of things on this list, cancer and heart disease, really stand out. But the thing I want to point out about this overall, the things that kill us today, are as opposed to that list from 1900, where if you found out that you had one of those things before you died, as opposed to this going on a death certificate post-mortem, you probably had hours or maybe days to live. However, most of the things on this list now, the ones that are highlighted here in red, are chronic conditions. If I get a diagnosis of one of these, it's likely not something that's going to kill me right away. This is the big advance in modern medicine, is many of these things that would have killed us before, we can now live with for weeks, months, years, sometimes for decades. So this has a dramatic impact on who we are as a population. Again, living 30 years longer is a drastic difference. So this is a wonderful advance in modern medicine, right? that many of us can live happier, longer, healthier lives, but there are challenges that go along with it. So right now, in many Western nations, we have about half of our population dealing with at least one chronic disease on an everyday basis. There are probably many people in this room dealing with something that's on this list. The older you get, the more likely you are to have to manage one of these conditions on an everyday basis. So I said I wanted to talk for a minute about demographics and economics. Right, our goal is to be this happy couple here. Right? Older, happy, living anywhere in the world for much longer than we would have any time before. But if we think about the impact of the changes in healthcare over the last century, it really does create some challenges for us. If we have half of our population, which is the case in many developed nations, managing one or more of these conditions on an everyday basis, we simply don't have enough people to provide care the way that we provided healthcare three, four, five decades ago. And the economics of this are, of course, an important challenge that all of our nations and all of us as individuals are facing on an everyday basis. I'm from the United States. I moved back there a couple of years ago. 
and we're spending over $3 trillion a year in the U.S. on healthcare. Now, kind of like that 7 billion population number, it's hard to envision exactly what that $3 trillion means, but as a percentage of GDP, or as a percentage of our individual incomes, the amount that we spend on healthcare today keeps going up, and largely because we're dealing with more and more of these chronic conditions. So, there are enormous challenges facing us today in being this happy, older couple, that lives well into our 70s, 80s, 90s. We have a fairly young crowd here. Hopefully by the time many of you reach this age, we're talking about 90s, 100s, 110s that we're living to in a fairly happy, healthy way. So let me set that aside for a minute. I said I wanted to talk about two seemingly different things this morning. And I'm going to turn and talk about robots for a few minutes. Actually, not exactly about robots. I want to talk about psychology. So, as you heard in the introduction, I've been working at the intersection of healthcare and technology for nearly two decades now. About 15 years ago, I went back to grad school at the MIT Media Lab, and I started working with a variety of different robots. This was one of the simplest that you see on the screen right here. Simply a pair of eyes that could look around or blink. Some of them we made a little bit more complex. Put that pair of eyes with this very fancy face on a little neck. It can move out towards someone when it's interacting with them. And a few other robots that I'll show you in a second. So like I said, this is not about technology, although obviously there was technology involved in building and programming these robots, but it's about the psychology of interaction. Particularly, we spent a lot of time comparing and contrasting this to interacting with a character on the screen, much the way that you're seeing this robot right now. Over two years, I used six robots and more than 400 people in a whole series of studies trying to understand the psychology of interaction. And we were comparing and contrasting to another place where we know a lot about interaction, a character on the screen, so human-computer interaction, or HCI, a field that's been around for more than 60 years now, and also drawing heavily on interaction that we're all familiar with on an everyday basis, the psychology of conversations and relationships. And these studies were sometimes really short, bring someone into a lab for five or 10 minutes, or bring a robot out to someone in the real world. Sometimes we bring people back or go back to them on a weekly basis. Sometimes we put robots in people's homes for months. So a whole variety of interactions and a whole variety of robots. So, you know, they got more complex, like Mel, the robotic penguin at Mitsubishi Electric, that we had actually fairly interactive conversations with people giving demonstrations uh, by Mel. Or things like Leonardo, a very advanced robot. This was built by a Hollywood studio, let me go back here a second, built by a Hollywood studio that's built a lot of other robots that you might know. Terminator, the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. So Leonardo is a fairly complex robot, 70 motors, half of those in his face, incredibly expressive face. Now, what I want to talk about for a minute is not so much the robots, but the studies. So throughout this course of studies, again, we were looking at the psychology of interaction with a variety of different kinds of robots. And what we found is when we compared people interacting with those versus something on the screen, there were two major differences. So the first is that people were more drawn into interacting with the robots, more engaged in that conversation. Now, part of that is novelty. Particularly almost 15 years ago, we bring someone in, put them in front of these robots, it's going to carry out a conversation with them, and there's a certain effect of, you know, wow, I get to talk to a robot. But the interesting part psychologically is after that novelty wears off, people remain engaged with that physical thing for significantly longer than an identical-looking character on the screen having the same conversation. So I'll come back to why in just a moment, but the other thing that we saw was when we're trying to convey information to people, when it's coming from that physical thing, it's seen as more credible, more informative. The character comes across as more trustworthy. So what we see is we end up with just these basic psychological differences of robot versus something on a screen. And as it turns out, this parallels the reason why we're all gathered in this room today. Many of you came from around Berlin or around Germany or other parts of Europe or the world. Some of us up here speaking came from many thousands of kilometers away to be here with you today. Most of us get this intuitively. 
we spend a lot of time interacting with other people face to face. And as it turns out, psychologists can tell us exactly why that's the case. When we're face to face with someone, we're more engaged in the interaction. We're, we create a stronger relationship. We find that person to be more credible, more trustworthy. What they're telling us comes across as more informative. And what we know from this set of studies and many others that have been done since then is that all of these differences carry over very strongly into technology. When you have someone interacting with a physical thing in front of them, you get those benefits of face-to-face -face interaction that we don't see when we put the same technology on the screen. So again, my interest is in applying technology to healthcare. So now I want to spend a couple of minutes tying together these two topics that we're talking about. So after these findings, I then spent the next four years building this incredible robot. Okay, so this was a prototype, but this got us started. The last half the time I was at MIT, I spent my time jointly between there and Boston University Medical Center, particularly in endocrinology in a weight management clinic, helping patients with losing weight and managing diabetes doing clinical work, seeing patients in the clinic day in and day out. But then I spent about a year building the hardware and software of what became a robotic weight loss coach, really embodying the ideas that we're just talking about in terms of the psychology, also drawing a lot on artificial intelligence. So bringing together the psychology of relationships, how we create, build up, and maintain relationships over time, using the artificial intelligence to craft conversations that were relevant to each patient at that point in time. What we ended up doing is, with these finished robots, we did a randomized controlled medical trial based out of Boston Medical. We enrolled 45 people. These were people who wanted to start dieting but currently weren't. And we randomly assigned people into one of three conditions. 15 people got this early version of the robot. Again, we'd hand-built these in the basement shops at the MIT Media Lab. Another 15 people got a computer with the same touchscreen as is on the front of the robot and identical software for helping them engage every day and keep coming back and doing what they were trying to do in terms of weight loss. And the third group of 15 got what is still today's standard of care in healthcare, the paper log. Here, write down each day what you're doing. Come back and see me in a month or two. And so, I'm not going to go into the details of the study, but I'll give you one quick anecdote before the results, and that is when I went back to pick these up after two months in people's homes, when I walked in, I could see an immediate difference. Right? First, I didn't see the paper logs. Those were stuck back in a drawer somewhere. No one really used them for more than a couple of weeks. The computers, people had used them for a few weeks, but you know, they were off in a corner somewhere as well. The robots were different, though. Not only were people still using them, they had dressed them up. They were wearing hats or scarves. One had a red feather boa around its neck. In the interviews afterwards, I found out that every single person had named their robot. We had Ingrid and Casper and Mary and all sorts of other things. Through that work, we were also looking a lot at the psychology of interaction and found that there was really a difference, really creation of a relationship between people and this robot. Now, this particular population was not an older population. The average age was probably a little bit older than the average age in this room, early 40s, and people were spending two or three minutes a day with this. Yet the results were incredible in terms of how we were able to keep people engaged in doing what they already wanted to do in managing their own health, but this gave them a tool to do that successfully. Now, let's jump back to the first topic, the demographics and, ec and economics of healthcare. So what I'm saying there about the aging population and the costs of healthcare continuing to go up are nothing new. There are a lot of people talking about this, and people have been talking about this for decades. And so what has been known is that we have to do something to change that. And what a part of that is, of course, is going to be introducing new technology. And particularly over the last 15 years, we've done a lot of this. Some of you in this room may know what this is. Some of the crowd is probably a little young for this, the CD-ROM. So over the last 15 years, I've seen three eras of technology in healthcare. There was about five years of the doctor saying, here, take this CD home, put it in your computer, install this application, and use this every day. It's going to help you manage your, you know, your diabetes better. And unfortunately, that really didn't work. Then we had the five years of, here, take this card home, type this address into your web browser, 
You know, it's going to uh, let you log into this application every day. Here's your login and password. You're going to do this, and it's going to help you better manage your heart disease. Didn't really work either. And then we had the five years that are still going on. We're at the tail end of this now of smartphones. Here, download this app and try this. Use this every day. It's going to you know, help you be healthier in this way. Unfortunately, these haven't worked either. Now, this is not to say anything necessarily bad about what's in these applications. Some of these have been very interactive, which is great. The content on many of them is wonderful, comes from you know, best healthcare practices. But the shortcoming of all of these is they don't engage us. You know, one universal truth is that we as people are great at making changes and absolutely terrible at sticking with them. Right? We're not giving these to people who don't want to do something. It's I've got a new diagnosis or I'm given a new treatment. I actually want to do this. I want to get better. But life gets in the way. I get busy. I go on vacation for a week. It's hard to get back to doing something. And with any of these technologies that we've used so far, it's been really difficult to keep me engaged over a long period of time. So, you know, I've talked about a technology that can really change that that can really start to help us engage and help us manage our own health care so that we can live healthier, happier, longer lives. Over the last year, our team at Catalia Health has been building something we call the Maybu Personal Health Care Companion. So I want to take the next 90 seconds to introduce how this might work in the lives of one of our patients, Edgar. today like roadkill i'm sorry to hear that would you like me to send a message to your team to see if there's anything they can do yes i'm glad you were able to talk with your pharmacist and that they adjusted your medication how are you feeling today better thanks patsy it's a nice sunny day out think you might go for a walk sure don't forget your medication and a bottle of water Want me to set a reminder? Good idea. So I know a lot of technology you see on a stage like this, you think, oh, that's great, you know, but it'll be really expensive in a long time in the future. So I just want to leave you with one last thing. These will be delivered to patients starting next year. Someone like Edgar right now might have a home health nurse visiting. The cost of this for a little companion that sits there and Edgar can talk to every day is less than having a home health, visit, home health nurse visit even once a week. So this is something that is real. And as we get older, this is the kind of technology that's going to help all of us live longer, happier, healthier lives. Thank you. <laughs>